It's my privilege on behalf of the On the Margins research team to welcome all of you to this conference, to our opening evening, and, and certainly to thank you for your support of this very important research. We're especially appreciative to the 240 women from this region who took the time to be interviewed. Please join me in giving them a great hand of applause. These are all phenomenal women. Black Women on the Margins is a research project which was exploring black women's health uh, related issues and access to health care in southwest Nova from Liverpool to Annapolis County. It's funded by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. The project took place from 2003 to 2006 and we recently had a conference in Yarmouth uh, in April 2006 called Black Women on the Margins from Research to Action. The whole purpose of the conference was really to take the research findings, take them back to the communities in which the research was held, and to uh, ask them to tell us what they wanted us to do with the findings. The Yarmouth Conference presented an opportunity for the research team to present an overview and findings of the project to a select audience from different walks of life. The project had its roots many years back in the concern of a young nurse in the Yarmouth region. Well, I was a graduate of the Yarmouth School of Nursing when I was a young woman, and um, I was asking questions about where are the black patients in the Yarmouth Hospital. Um, I knew that we were surrounded by a lot of black, small black communities, but I, I didn't see them in the hospitals, I didn't see them in the nursing homes and people couldn't give me those kinds of answers. Um, when I graduated, I would be doing um, some uh, Red Cross uh, home nursing courses, and I frequently went to uh, uh, Greenville. And while I was there, I met with a lot of black women who took the courses from me, and we began to discuss the reasons why there weren't a lot of black patients, why a lot of black men and women did not go to family doctors or access the health care system as much as the population should have demanded because there are so many black communities in southwestern Nova Scotia. And I've thought about that over the years. Um, so probably about, uh, I would say, five or six years ago, I can't remember specifically now, the idea came to me to talk to public health nurses in this area and in Halifax as well and ask them uh, what their clientele looked like. Did they have a lot of people of color in their practice? And they said no. And in fact, many of the people, the, the public health nurses said to me that they didn't have any uh, black uh, patients that they visited. And uh, I then tried to get the Department of Public Health to uh, come in with us at the School of Nursing and to do a research project about that uh, to find out what was happening within the healthcare system uh, that was excluding a lot of uh, people of color. Black people in Nova Scotia represent a huge proportion of the visible minority population in this part of the country. And while there seem to be initiatives left, right, and center that are focused on newcomers, and, and that's important work, uh, it seems that often the African Nova Scotians who've been living here for generation upon generation get missed. We don't know very much at all about their health and well-being. And uh, the kinds of things that we do know about health tend to come from other jurisdictions, particularly the United States, where thanks to people like Dr. Martin Luther King, there's been a lot more effort made to understand the experience of African Americans than there has been to understand the experiences of African Canadians. This actually made the research very important and very significant and 
especially when you think about this project being done in rural Nova Scotia. So we're talking about black women's access to health care in very marginalized parts of a province that's already marginalized. And so the significance of it really means that we, we had no information on what kinds of issues, health issues we were dealing with and what sort of access people really had. So the research really helped us get much, much better understanding of those issues. The whole purpose of the conference was really to take the research findings, take them back to the communities in which the research was held, and to uh, ask them to tell us what they wanted us to do with the findings. Altogether, there were 237 women over the age of 18 who were interviewed for the purpose of the study. The result is a phenomenal amount of information by any research standards. The richness and success of the research was flavored by the complementary composition of the research team. Uh, when this team came together uh, over three years ago, we brought together people with different backgrounds, people with different expertise. And I think coming together to share that has really enriched each one of us. We brought people with academic background, people that have done some research on black women's health, on black men's health. We brought, uh, we brought together people who had good knowledge about their community and some of the issues affecting people in their community. And so all of these expertise came together to make this project a successful project. The success also relied very heavily on the commitment of the three facilitators who conducted the field interviews. Uh, one facilitator would did Shelburne County and the surrounding uh, black communities. The other facilitator did Yarmouth County and the surrounding black communities. And I did Digby County and Annapolis County. I had the largest, the largest area. It was so crucial to have the three black community facilitators out going out into the community to be actually doing uh, the interviews like they were the heart and soul from my perspective of, of the whole project and a big part of the reasons for its success. The research was a holistic look at the health status of black women, those social, political and economic factors that come into play in the lives of black women and their families. These were identified as an interplay and intertwining of various factors. Poverty is a major issue facing black communities in rural and remote Nova Scotia and we know that to be the case and we knew that going into the study. Um, but by talking with women and by hearing these stories firsthand, we were really able to see firsthand how poverty affects the health of black women and their families. Now in our sample of 237 women, 62% reported that their average personal income was less than $15,000 a year. And 28% reported that their average household income was less than $15,000 a year. So you can see that that's really, really significant. And 75% of women in our study overall reported having some kind of financial difficulties. And so in terms of health, there's a, a number of ways in which this becomes a major health issue and a major health determinant. Uh, first of all, there's the link between poverty and stress. And while many women were very reluctant to talk about their actual incomes and to give actual numbers, um, they were very quick to identify poverty as a major source of stress in their lives. They worried about not being able to pay bills, owing money, and just simply not being able to make ends meet. Stressed out every day, every day of my life. Yes, I am. Worrying about paying this and worried about paying that. Can't sleep hardly at night. And when you do get to sleep, that's what you dream about. How am I going to pay this? How am I going to pay that? So one of the examples that really stands out in my mind is the, the need to eat healthy, so preventative health care. But really, when you don't have enough money to, to eat healthy, the healthy foods cost more. It was amazing the things that came up in our meetings. Uh, in fact, when we talk about some of the issues that the facilitators were facing uh, when they did interviews, some of the things they were learning, they would even uh, build on some of the things that the women had told them, and we would be surprised. I remember one day we were at a meeting and we talked about uh, some of the things women told them, maybe cancer situation or the kinds of condition in which they lived in. 
And one of the facilitators told us, he said, yes. People used to pick from the dorm. People used, and everybody in the room was like, what? He said, yes, even when I was growing up, we go to the dorm, we pick things from the dorm to eat, and we were really surprised in Nova Scotia that this sort of everyday stress can contribute to a number of other health problems, including things like high blood pressure and heart disease, concerns that were also prevalent in these communities. Of the 237 women interviewed, 48% were struggling with high blood pressure. 35% had high cholesterol, and 28% were diabetic. One of the things that we found in this research was the everyday experiences of racism have a negative impact on people's uh, capacity to just be healthy. And so it, it impacts their psychological health and well-being their emotional health and well-being, their physical health and well-being. It, it really impacts everything, uh, all of who they are. Almost all of the women agreed that racism is a major problem facing black communities. Some women talked about racist systems and institutes, while others talked about specific experiences of racism, racist comments, attitudes, and incidents that they had endured throughout their lives as children in schools and as adults. Why go to the hospital if I'm just going to be discriminated against? There really is no sense. If you are stressed out because you have something, why go to the hospital and be more stressed because people are going to be judging you? You might as well stay home. I spoke to uh, one woman at one point to ask her, I, I didn't do any interviews, I don't mean to imply that, but I spoke to someone that I knew initially um, when I was first developing the first proposal and said to her, why is it that um, you don't access the public health nurse because this woman in particular lived out in, in an area that was relatively remote and the public health nurse did have that district and she said, these pretty little white women have nothing in common with me and they don't understand me. Participants also talked about struggling with the high cost of medication and many were very worried that they would at some point get sick because they knew that if that happened they wouldn't be able to afford the medication and afford the proper treatment. Also very important is transportation, getting to and from hospitals especially in very remote communities Employment, or lack thereof, is also a significant determinant of health. Quite a few of the women who participated in this study were unemployed and looking for work at the time of the interviews, which was often very stressful. And our research found that black women living in rural Nova Scotia face a number of different barriers when it comes to looking for employment. Um, one such example is racism. Some women felt that they were being discriminated against when they went to apply for jobs. And they were very clear about pointing out that, you know, in their communities, there were very few black people working as professionals. The research also revealed that as caregivers, black women often put their health on hold to take care of loved ones. These heavy demands, the lack of social support, and resources inevitably heighten the emotional strain. Black women's definition of health um, is very much tied to the context of their life. The things that are happening in their life, racism, so you cannot go and look at the incidence of high blood pressure without looking at the things that influence those, uh, the incidence of the high blood pressure. We have to look at racism, we have to look at all of those social conditions, and uh, poverty, unemployment, all of those things impact on the physical health of black women. In the face of overwhelming barriers, black women in these rural and remote areas have had to devise ways to manage their delicate physical health and overall well-being. The attitude, the attitude about your health is just as important as the medication you may be taking. Because the medication on its own doesn't, doesn't uh, do it all, right? So there was a strong awareness about that, that the attitude is important. Taking things one day at a time. Now, how many times have we heard that? You know, the importance of, of really taking things one day at a time, not thinking too far ahead, but really uh, 
just managing the stress of everyday life. And these black women were, and you've heard already, you know, about the stress, the poverty, the family and community issues, the, the, uh, how that could be overwhelming if you begin to think about all of that. But some of these women who we interviewed very clearly told us that one of the ways that they manage is by taking things one day at a time. What, it's not enough just to gather this information. What are we going to do with it? So now is the time where you get to talk and ask some questions. And During the two-day conference, participants held interrogation sessions. They also converged in different talking circles to listen to reports of similar investigations and to brainstorm on the way forward. There's an expectation amongst the 237 women who were interviewed here. There's an expectation that things will change. The women were telling us that there are, that the, the, the needs of the women may be very different than the needs of the children, the needs of the adolescents, the needs of men, the needs of the elderly. And so they were very, although this research was about black women's health, it really was about black family and community health. And the women were also telling us that they want more culturally competent health care providers and more culturally competent health care. They were very clearly saying that that's an issue. That's a serious issue because they want to be understood. They don't want to have to explain the context. And remember what, what Dr. Otto was saying earlier, the context of the women's lives has, is so significant in terms of their health. Very clearly, the women were telling us that they want more affordable medication. And for, if you're not on a drug plan, and let's say you have two of the most prevalent health conditions in our communities, diabetes and hypertension, the two of them combined, if you don't have a health plan, the cost of the drugs are astronomical. And if, if you're unemployed, you don't have a drug plan. If you're employed in a place that, that doesn't have benefits, you don't have a drug plan. So these women are saying, there's got to be a way to provide us with more affordable medication. Of course, they also talked about access. They want more accessible health services. They're saying that to have to travel to Halifax, for example, to have some major tests done creates huge, huge barriers for women in these rural communities. We have to be able to, be able to reach out somewhere and say, look, I need attention. Because I mentioned sickle cell, but there are certain things that we are prone to that the others are not. And we need specialists. We need to know that if this happens, who can we grab? Do we have to go to the Mayo Clinic? Do we have to go to Toronto? Do we have to? Why can't we have it here in Nova Scotia? Because we have one of the largest black population in Canada, so why not? And we ask, why not? And the women are asking, why can't they have more affordable medication? They're asking, why can't we have more accessible health services? They're asking, why can't we have more culturally competent health providers and more culturally competent care? They're asking, why can't we have more information and education around health issues that are so significant to their lives? I think it was very important to have this conference and for people to come together and hear about it. But it needs to go a step beyond. Um, I think that the, uh, the people who make policy, the politicians, need to hear this. Uh, need to hear this story and need to be asked, you know, with the information that's come from this study, what do we now do? What can we do in the community uh, to make a difference? Everybody here understands what racism has done to, and poverty has done to its citizens for which the healthcare system is supposed to be equal for all. But now it has to come from the governmental level. We have to have politicians here. Politicians should be sitting there in the front row and they should be accountable. One of the things that came, that emerged from the findings was a play on black women's health uh, entitled, Who Will Care for Aunt Ethel? 
And uh, we're looking at maybe taking that play across the province and again disseminating the findings very widely. Did it more tests? Did the doctor tell you that? Is that why I can't stay in that hospital at the right now? I can't be away from her. Charlotte, listen. All they want to do is take a closer look at that lump in your breast is all. Well, from what I can understand. Mm. Couldn't understand a thing that man was saying. All those great big words. I just looked up. Didn't ask a question. Because I wasn't let that man know that I didn't understand the thing he was saying. <laughs> Not me. But I'll tell you what we can do. We can go into the hospital tomorrow, and we'll see Dr. Shingles. And she'll explain everything we need to know. You know what? You might get some rest from that pain you have. We'll take the tests, and then you'll get something for it. Yes, I suppose you're right. I'm just glad you're going with me as all that. But I can't go tomorrow. I can't leave her alone right now. And for God's sakes, don't mention a word to Lena. Oh, Charlotte, I wouldn't say a word to nobody. <laughs> Not nothing. You know that. But you know, I really think you should go in tomorrow. You know, after Dr. Shingle, she's quick. Charlie, what's the matter with your eyes? A bloodshot. Oh, so now you are an eye specialist now, are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm fine. I'm just a little tired is all. Poor company, I would imagine, as well. I have a bit of a headache. I think I want to take an aspirin before supper. Charlie, I feel you. You've got a temperature. Well, I do feel a bit funny. Can't seem to move, Apple. Well, don't just lay back. Don't even try to move. You know, I can see you're no better today. Charlotte, you need a lot of rest and you need to eat. Now you just lay back a minute and I'll get my tonic. I'll put that stuff all over you, child, and I'll take all the information you got out of me. Lena, no. could you come could you no, come? no, no, don't bother them. They are resting. I ain't such a bother. I'll be all right, it'll pass. I know it'll pass, but I want you to lay down anyway. Lay down in the middle of the day? <laughs> and we have a quilt that very uh, creatively displays some of the key findings from the research, and we want that to reach as many people as possible across the province as well. The quilt is designed to help create awareness and a dialogue about health concerns that emerge from the On the Margins research project. It will also serve as a tool to get others talking about health concerns in the areas that it visits, as well as a creative method demonstrating how others can come together to share similar concerns in their communities. Our goal was to display the artistic symbol of On the Margins Research Project. This is the first research project that was actually done with black women on the Southwest Nova, and they want their voices heard.